could be a, its own little topic there about embellishing what it means to work in game design like that. When it comes to a lot of these independent developers, you hear this from, like, you hear again about these major successes, but you rarely hear again about the amount of work and sometimes the amount of bad work that has gone into these titles. With, like, the Unkyo class description there. Mm hmm. Like, like, and we've said this before that there really isn't any game. That should take five plus years to be made. Oh, that's lovely. And I'm, it's very harsh. I know there's probably a few developers watching this, and I know we've spoken to a few developers on some of our casts who've spent four plus years making one title. And. Oh. Tell them to send me, um, tell them that I really want to play next, uh, Makania, too. <laughs> but, when it comes to a lot of these games, like, it just never seems like, and we've said this before with Owlboy as well, that game that was on and off again for ten years, that you rarely see th that amount of work. But again, but the other side is that we haven't really talked about is that the developers who do spend this time or who do sometimes get pulled up because of it, they were basically probably doing a lot of things wrong. And part of the Rin interview that I saw with the Iconoclast developer was him describing that for a good three to four years, he was basically living at, at a friend's apartment and barely, he wasn't even like paying rent there. And he was just trying, he was basically surviving off of, excuse me, friends and family to finish that game. And while there's nothing wrong with that, it's kind of very misleading for developers and people to, you know, not really describe the hardships of what it means to make a video game for a living. Again, the people watching this right now, whether it's live or recorded, I'm sure a few of you, I know a few of you, have your own personal horror, horror stories along those lines. And again, most consumers will never care, let alone even hear about that information. And it is very scary to make a video game. And it's, I think this is, again, one of those big issues when it comes to game journalism and gaming YouTubers and stuff like that, that, again, they only discuss the hits. They only discuss the massive successes. And it can, a game can only be an amazing title that will be a Game of the Year winner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know, Mike. Everything here on YouTube is great. I get... All that uh, fat Gillette uh, Mountain Dew and uh, Wheaties money. Or, I'm sorry, Gatorade money as well. You know, they keep, I'm waiting for that check for them to send me in the mail. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that news. Like, y again, like, quality certainly takes time. But there is something to be said about spending too long on a single game as well. Like, if it takes you seven years to make one game, how many smaller projects could you have done in that time to even improve your own skills at? And you'll hear from a lot of developers who say that, you know, I learned so much while I'm designing this game. Well, of course you did. You spent seven years on it. I mean, if you didn't learn anything from that, I think we would all be really concerned. But, again, the dreams... Yep. The, the dream idea that I'm going to spend 5 to 10 years of my life on one game, and it will basically pay off all my debt, all my loans, you know, I can retire, is a myth. You can learn medicine in around 6 years, so that's good. Mm hmm And there's a full experience, yeah. They, yep, oh yeah, I mean, how many people go onto a Steam forum 
and they will complain to the developer saying, why are you not lowering the game's price? You're a millionaire. You know, you, the game was $10, you sold, no, it was $20, you sold 500,000 copies, you must be a millionaire for that. And it's like, no, that's not how game dev works. And, again, it's very, uh, this is very bad. It goes back to an article I wrote about in Medium about the problem with modern game journalism like that. That if you're just giving that impression that everything is perfect and that nothing goes wrong, you're not really preparing people for the realities of what it means to be a game developer. And yet, like, game dev is one of the lowest paying jobs. <laughs> nice. Yeah, maybe, Mojo. I would like to check out that game at some point. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's very hard, I think, for... And I know a lot of, like, kids, they don't understand that. And, again, nobody really talks about that as well. In terms of what that means uh, to succeed in this market. And, yeah, like, even... Oh, it is 90% off. All right. Maybe I'll grab that off of Steam on a list of some other games as well. But uh, getting back to the top, and, and even they're a good example of that, that next uh, uh, Makania game, that House Marquee has been really struggling with trying to get people to play that game, and even if it wins all, that, all those rewards and has all those high reviews, doesn't mean anything if nobody's buying it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you going to bring Unity back into the discussion? Let's see. But for a lot of these studios, like you see them again pushing through the pain with that passion. I think uh, some people uh, point out like Slime Rancher was another example of that. Like there was a time where they would. I remember this was in the article that I was reading last night that they were saying something like. If they do this now, they will not see any money for six months. Now, that could be a, a decent amount of money or a good amount of money, but again, you're going six months without a paycheck or six months without additional money like that. Mm hmm. Yep. Oh yeah, and again, you don't know how much money was spent making that game because everybody is different. You know, somebody, and of course, people who have part-time and full-time jobs on top of doing game design. Because that's the other thing you don't let hear about. They, a lot of people assume that a game developer is just somebody who sits, you know, in their sits at their computer eight to ten hours a day, and magic happens. And no, I'm pretty sure everybody will argue that's not how game design works. And without being able to properly explain to people what this all means, it's really creating that false reality. I mean, there are a lot of independent developers right now who are dreading 2019 in terms of whether or not they're going to have the money to keep going. That whole indie apocalypse thing. Let's see here. Need to pick that up at some point too. Yep, the math is the magic, exactly. And this has been an issue with the independent scene or with just game development for so long that most, again, anyone who's not covering or really talking about the game industry doesn't know or even care about this. Like for instance, like further proof for me that a lot of the big name gaming YouTubers are just useless is that I saw like nobody bring up the whole Star Breeze uh, dissolving issue that we talked about about two weeks ago with how much Star Breeze has mismanaged the hell out of all their revenue. <laughs> and it's probably going to lead to um, payday, it's probably going to lead to payday 3 either being cancelled or maybe being sold to another studio to be worked on. Uh-oh. 
<laughs> Trigonometry Masters? I only have heard of that one. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Trigonometry. A 99 cent game. Oh yeah, wasn't that the Avision Soft Reset developer who we were also ranting about YouTubers and streamers there? That was fun. It's always great to have somebody else to rant along there with. But again, most people don't really see what's going on. And again, you're not going to see what's going on unless you either talk to somebody directly or you actually work at that company or you do it yourself. Again, news for people who are watching this right now. News was a developer behind Chromasia Rock Paper Scissors Tactics, and he's currently working on Project Triad. And he's kind of had been, or he has first experience with what it means to have to do that math in terms of trying to make a game while still trying to earn a living. And again, like there are a lot of people who, again, they see like that five million dollar. They see the number $5 million and think that person is set for life. But, get, but as you said, $5 million with three years in development, 30 employees at $20 an hour. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of long time before they do that. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah, Mike. Like, that's another really big point there. Like, a lot of the 3D independent games we see either burn out before their release... Or there are these very low-quality acid flip games. All those very adult-minded games that I mentioned but can't reveal when we do our weird game segment, it's basically like that. It looks like, you know, 1997 uh, 3D computer graphics. Or, I'm sorry, maybe 2001, 2002. And, yeah, like, 3D is a very big trap for first-time developers. Because it takes a lot of money to do 3D right. Again, any developer watching this is probably nodding their head at that statement. You cannot make a good-looking 3D game with the same amount of time and money as a good-looking 2D game. And we've said this before, many of the 2D games we've played for like retro games and our classic game nights, they still hold up well. Because it still has that look to it. It's kind of like to me, oh boy, if calling YouTube was useless is going to get me in trouble, you're going to love this one. It's one of the things why I don't like the state of modern cartoon animation. The CGI look, it has a very cheap look to it. That everything starts to look very similar, very same. Like, it's one of the reasons why I still love like Looney Tunes and a lot of like, the older Disney stuff. Like that hand-drawn appeal to it. Still, it looks like somebody took time and care to make it look like that. And again, if you watch like any of the old Looney Tunes cartoons, like they still hold up relatively well in terms of their animation quality, for the most part, I would say. I don't uh, quote me on this one, though, Joe. I'm sure news can probably attest to this more than I can. I think the developers are given a Usually, if it's a major Steam sale, the developers are usually contacted in advance by Valve to let them know that there's going to be a sale and ask them how much they want to have off for it. Now, the developer wants to do a sale, then they're free to, I think, do whatever the heck they want. Uh, right now, while I was looking at, there is the, one second, the Black and White Indie Game Bundle, which is a bunch of indie games that are, well, obviously black and white on sale and that I think is done entirely by those developers and Steam doesn't really like control that like if you want to set up a bundle for your games you can do that at your leisure uh, let's see but yeah like getting back to the 3D comment like um, ga uh, Gas Lamp Games being a really good example of that trap. Uh, yeah, here it is. Like, their first game, Dungeons of Dreadmore, or, 
Yeah, wait, they did a second game? Oh, they did kind of a mock, kind of like a visual novel or something like that. But Dungeons of Dreadmore was very successful. It was a top-down isometric roguelike that we played on stream. You know, very, you know, over the top in terms of its dialogue. And it earned them a lot of goodwill. And it probably, you know, paid for itself and then some. And then they spent a good four to five years making uh, Clockwork Empires. And this was them going with a 3D Dwarf Fortress steampunk game. And it killed the company. I mean, it literally killed that company. They released it because they ran out of money, and it's now been downvoted to hell. And it's such a shame about that game dying. But, I mean, they definitely bit off more than what they could chew. Hmm. And yeah, those forms have not been updated in over a year. So even the fan-made patch for Clockwork Empires is dead. And that was really good. I played a stream of that like about last year. The fans and uh, supporters got together and they basically created their own uh, patch to try and fix and add on to Clockwork Empires. And it was looking good. But again, it was them working for free. And you can't really ask, you can't really hold people to a project when they're free. Uh, Void Bastards is still not out yet. Uh oh, Voice is starting to die. Oh, that must mean it's a good cast when my voice is dying, right? Let's see. Hmm. And it's still saying 2019 for Void Bastards. I think, didn't we say that they weren't going to do a, they weren't doing an early access? Oh, man. Voice well, is really dying there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not seeing anything new about it, so I'm sure they're going to wait. But yeah, like, it's becoming a lot harder. Hmm. Yep. I mean, that's, like, the very bad thing about games is, like, the whole idea of the lack of post-mortems on your various titles. Oh, man, my voice is going there. <laughs> but... Uh, it's again getting back to the lack of transparency when it comes to games and the fact we don't really see too many postmortems. This is why that the games failure workshop that we see at GEC is such an important point about being an indie developer. Like, and the sad part. <laughs> exactly, I need a bigger bottle. Like, remember when we did that talk about where the water tastes like wine? Which is actually a really good point. Maybe I should get some wine in this bottle instead. That when we read that postmortem, like there are some people who looked at those comments that people are saying, saying, no, that's not nice. You don't want to say that about him. You're kicking a man when he's down. But when we were reading about some of those decisions, it was basically like, how could this game be a success given what was described here? And again, it's another one of those harsh realities that even if you think you're doing the right thing, you can still be doing the wrong thing when it comes to your games. And it's very sad about that, but it's one of the reasons why we need mo more postmortems on games. Because again, you're not going to know what you did wrong or not going to know why a game didn't work unless you hear about it. Again, 50 different YouTubers can talk about um, Apex Legends complaining that because there's more... Uh, people of color in that game that's going to fail. Or that because characters are the uh, LGBT uh, variety that the game's, you know, pandering is going to fail like that. Because that popped up in a few of my feeds too, which is always great. But the real success or failure behind a game, 
you really have to look at what the developer is saying above all else. And again, sometimes the developer will know why a game didn't work. They'll say, you know, right up front, you know, I spent all this time with this mechanic and it didn't work. Or maybe, uh, or this was very uh, poorly implemented. And sometimes they won't know why a game worked. And that's another really big point. A lot of people assume in most cases that video games are these perfectly developed projects, which I know right now probably both News and Mike are rolling their eyes, you know, probably in a concert there as I'm saying that. And for a lot of these games... I don't know about that, Mike. I do think there are some standardized practices that you do need to keep an eye on, whether it is from a marketing point of view or even just from a UI and playability point of view. Like, one of the big things that we're seeing a lot more talk about is accessibility features. And I think that is one that should be standard. You know, colorblind mode, uh, subtitles, and there's an entire list of that, I think, on the GDC and other sites about, you know, standard features that will make games playable for everyone. But, back uh, to the original point there, that a lot of people will see a video game as being this perfectly designed thing that, you know, the developer did exactly everything right. But again, some of the best or some of the more interesting titles have come out of either failure or really just experimentation. Mm-hmm. And like we used Silent Hill as an example. Many people who played Silent Hill, I'm sure many reviewers, commented on the fact that the fog effect was so great, it really made the world come alive and, you know, brought this level of mysteriousness. And then it was revealed that the fog was literally just them trying to cut back on engine on the rendering on the engine because it couldn't handle having everything on screen without slowdown. And again, you sometimes run into that. Again, uh, necessity is the motherhood of, event of invention. We talked about this last week with the importance of limitations and the whole problem of a blank slate. Again, if you can literally make whatever you want, how do you come up with a game plan to make everything? And not including the game, everything, or everything the game that we did. I think I did a V on that one two years ago. But... You do have to do playtesting. You need to have people to look at your game to figure out why something is working or why it doesn't. And I think this is another big point that a lot of people miss out on. That, again, like, just because a game is massively successful, excuse me, that doesn't mean that that developer just literally sat in a, you know, lived in a cave for three to five years, never went on the internet, never spoke to anybody, you know, they clicked, uh, they hit that one key on their keyboard to send it to Steam, and now they're a multimillionaire. No. They did lots of playtesting. You have to do research to figure out why, what makes people like your game. Um, that the developer we just spoke to, that um, the Bombfest one, he said that he literally changed his game, you know, a quarter halfway through it, because more people were liking the bomb mechanic rather than the cooperative puzzle mechanic. And, again, sometimes that happens. Again, you don't know what your game is going to do unless people are actually able to see it and play it. And like we said further up, again, playtesting. It doesn't matter if you think your game is great if everybody hates it. Yeah, and again, the echo chamber effect is a big part of that. And again, a lot of people don't want to hear that. And this is another thing we see from a lot of gaming YouTubers, that they'll say stuff like when a developer gets criticism or they change a game saying, you know, SJWs force developer to make changes or a uh, developer forced to get woke in order to make their game marketable. No, that's not how it works. If you have a lot of people saying that they don't like X in your game they would buy if you don't have it, then you have then you need to think about, well, do I want ten to fifteen thousand more people interested in my video game? Yep. 
And again, there's that fine line between, you know, when a game is your idea and when you're building it for a community or for a market. Because again, a lot of people will assume that these games are handled as a singular vision. That the developer is, you know, God, King, and Country, and how dare you, you know, question their resolve and their choices. And, you know, I am doing this perfectly, and, you know, nothing will go wrong with it. But the best games are designed with an open mind. Now, like we said when we talk with John Brieger about this when it comes to playtesting, there are people who will think they'll go too far in that other direction, saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> Should I just uh, throw that on a few of my thumbnails, Mike? There are people who will say that, you know, any change somebody suggests, they will implement. You know, can I have a uh, random loot generation? Sure, we'll put that in. Well, can we have online multiplayer? Sure, let's do that. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that was one of the things uh, where the war tastes like wine uh, ran into. Again, it was a critical darling. Many sites like Polygon, Kotaku, uh, many indie game developers were pushing for that game, saying it's the best damn thing ever. Then we all played, and it was like, what the hell am I looking at here? Yep. And you have to be able to read between the lines when it comes to suggestions like that. Uh, again, like, John said this really well. I'm going to try and paraphrase it, that it, you have to be as receptive to good critis to just good praise, or just praise, as you are to negative feedback. And you have to be able to read between the lines as to what people are saying. Because nobody's going to tell you exactly how to make your game. You know, no commenter is going to put on a Steam forum, if you do this, 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 and this, your game will... And by doing that, your game will sell 5 million copies. They'll like to say that. Of course, how many people on Steam will say, just add multiplayer, you'll sell 200,000 copies. Or, I'll buy this game, but add in full multiplayer, you know, online servers to it. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. And like we said last time, there are plenty of developers out there who do not like to listen to criticism. Unless it's of the good kind. You know, the, oh, it's so horrible that your game didn't turn out well. And we even saw, again, there's plenty of people who will attack people, even if they think that they were having criticism. That whole uh, Guild Wars 2 fiasco. From last, from last year is a good example of that. And again, you have to be able to be open to all this stuff. Because again, it, you, you cannot design a game in just your own personal echo chamber. And again, that's... <laughs> uh, don't make me respond to that one. Like, I won't get in any more trouble than I probably already am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. And yet you have but uh you taking that further, you still <laughs> appendix issues with your game. Yep. But there is still some elements that you have to be malleable on when it comes to making your title. Because if you don't do that, if you just refuse, that can lead to a worse selling game. Even if it's the game you want to make. Uh, Brigador is a great example of that. When I spoke with Hugh about the game, he was completely opposed to the more... Uh, I don't know, how we describe that control scheme? I know, kind of like uh, he was more opposed to the dual stick control scheme in Brigador. He wanted that tank-like controls that was more reminiscent of games like... Uh, Jungle Strike, uh, Sudden Strike, stuff like that. And it hurt the game because a lot of people didn't want to deal with that. And then when you release the Up Armored Edition that allowed for that set of controls alongside the tank like, it got a lot more people to play it. Mm hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there you go. 
But the point again being that, and even if so many people play that game, that's another big thing, and I think we'll begin to wrap things up because my voice is starting to die, that even if a game does get a second or a third life or anything like that, that still doesn't mean that it's doing all right. Just because a lot of people heard of Skyshine's Bedlam after the Redux version or Brigadier Up Armored, that game still had a lot of trouble. I hope not. I don't like tank like controls. I'm glad that when we play the Resident Evil 1 uh, remake or remaster that that wasn't in there. And again, that's another really good point about developers who are so locked. <laughs> there you go. Was it lupus? I learned that from House. But that's another point where developers are not about lupus, but about developers who are so locked to an idea or a design that they will try to, again, fit a square peg into a round hole to make it work, even if it could have been easier just to do something else. And this gets back to the major uh, topic, again, about, again, kind of the misleading of what it means to do game design, that developers will will try and boost themselves and you'll see again this in a lot of interviews saying that you know they did whatever they did everything they did was right and by if you just do that and nothing else you will be a massive success when it comes to the game industry <laughs> and again it doesn't work like that or the games that it does work like that you never know if it could have gotten better if they would have done something a little bit differently. And that's the very scary thing about game design. Again, when you release a game, whether you spend six months, six years, uh, 30 minutes on it, you don't know how people are going to respond to it. Everybody wants the next Flappy Bird, Five Nights at Freddy's, Fortnite. Again, insert game here kind of discussion. But... You A, you don't know the amount of work that went into that game, and B, there's no way of knowing at the time if it's going to be a success. Again, publishers want sequels because they think that's the easiest or that's the safest gamble, and it is in some sense. If I know that Assassin's Creed uh, did, you know, let's say, I don't know sales on the top of my head, let's say Assassin's Creed Odyssey sold 3 million copies. Well, on their next Assassin's Creed game, they can kind of budget around thinking that maybe around that amount, give or take, will buy the next game. The same thing with Call of Duty. But, mm -hmm. but the problem, though, is that you can't always reliably know that. And it's always that very big risk when it comes to game design. I mean, how many games have we played on stream that are unique original titles that still cost a studio and even probably put a lot of people out of a job? And they could still be really great games. It, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't matter. And it's why we were talking about earlier about the importance of marketing, playtesting, getting the word out there. But at the end of the day... It is a very scary place to be in the game industry, and as independent developers are saying, this year is probably going to be very, be even scarier. Mm hmm. Or just do, or use just like two sets of buttons. You know, W S A D, or no, you could do like left, right, W, S, like that, I suppose. Now we're getting off topic talking about tank controls <laughs> instead of scaring people. But more discussions need to be had about the harsh reality of when it comes to making a video game. Because, again, a lot of people don't see that. And it is definitely, at least on my Twitter with all the independent developers I'm following, very much a sign of doom and gloom. For a lot of people. And again, you'll never know unless the developer will flat out tell you just how much money they really earned. Because 
selling for some developers selling 25,000 copies was, you know, more than anything they could ever imagine. And then for some developers selling 2 million copies or like what we see with EA, you know, 2 to 3 million copies sold is considered a failure. And I know with that sentence, every independent developer watching this right now is probably clutching their chest and their heart and thinking about their game sold 2 to 3 million copies. And it's very... Eh, I think the answer to that is going to come in the next uh, 10 months. <laughs> Again, like for a lot of these games, you just will never know how much work or how much they really need to keep going. Hey, Draken, I am afraid you came right at the end of this. Uh, where are we at again? Uh, almost hour and forty minute talk. I don't think yet. Yeah, I don't. I think the industry, in some sense, is too big to fail. But I do think a lot of people are going to be hurt in terms of staying around. And again, it's a very pessimistic kind of view that if the developer was good enough, the game would have sold. But again, as we've said, that's not always the case. And here is my final question, and I'm going to end the stream on this for people watching this live or recorded. Do you think the, the store should handle the responsibility of marketing a game for you. And that leads to a lot of discussions. And for new people watching this right now, again, we'll probably be talking about this in the Discord channel. Link down below. It is open to everybody. But 